Okay, so welcome to this next video on uh, the nuclear factor of activated T cells and the nuclear factor kappa B. Okay, so we've seen uh, the mechanisms by which the nuclear factor of activated T cells and the nuclear factor kappa B have been activated uh, by increases in cytosolic calcium. Now what we want to see is... Um, of the, if you've got a certain number of calcium ions that you can use to stimulate the cell with, what is the best way to use them? I, uh, if you're going, you've you've got a certain number of calcium ions, ions a number, a set number, and I'll tell you exactly how we can uh, do this experimentally in a moment. You've got a set number of calcium ions. Let's say you've got 10 million to put in. Um, what is the best way to deliver them? Is the best way to deliver them all at once? Will that deliver you the most output from your nuclear factor kappa B and your nuclear factor of activated T cells? Or is there a better way of doing it? Would it be better to uh, deliver a million at a time? And then if you do that, what's the best um, interval to use? Do you wait um, a minute between giving the million calcium ions? Or do you wait an hour? Uh, these sort of questions we're going to now uh, look at and we're going to uh, try and understand the answers that we get in terms of the mechanisms by which the nuclear factor of activated T cells and the nuclear factor kappa B uh, work. Okay, right. So firstly, let me tell you how you can deliver a certain number of calcium ions to the cytoplasm of a cell. Well, basically, the way that you do it is you used is you use caged IP3. Okay, so let me tell you about what caged IP3 is. Caged IP3 uh, basically is uh, a molecule that is not active, uh, but if you uh, shine UV on that molecule, what will happen is it will uncage and it will release an IP3 molecule which is active. So basically, caged IP3 is a molecule that you can put into cells and then in a very controlled way, you can activate that caged IP3 to release normal IP3 and therefore you can give the cells certain amounts of IP3 basically. Okay, so how does this work? Well, basically we can draw our IP3 molecule at, like so. We can draw this six-membered carbon ring, which represents the inositol molecule. So uh, remember, IP3 stands for uh, inositol 1,4,5-trisphosphate. Inositol 1,4,5-trisphosphate. Now, inositol is a six-carbon ring where every single carbon has a hydroxyl group coming off it. And basically, if you are talking about inositol 1,4,5-trisphosphate, it means that you have phosphorylated uh, the first, the fourth, and the fifth hydroxyl group, basically. So, uh, we'll demonstrate that like so. We'll put on these sort of balls to represent phosphate groups. So here's the phosphate group of the first um, carbon. Here's the phosphate group of the um, fourth carbon. And here's the phosphate group of the fifth carbon. Okay, so that is how we will draw inositol 1,4,5-trisphosphate. At least this is how we'll draw a cartoon of it. Uh, because drawing the whole molecular structure, uh, we've almost done it in a way. We've almost drawn the skeletal structure, but it's easier and nicer for the eye uh, to just have this picture. Right. Now, um, the first thing is to say that um, how do you actually get this um, IP3 into uh, a cell? You see, the problem is... Uh, these phosphate groups, they have a negative charge. Now, that's not um, a very easy molecule to get through a phospholipid bilayer, because remember the structure of the phospholipid bilayer is that you have these two layers of phospholipids where the uh, polar heads of the phospholipids face either the um, extracellular fluid in the case of this outer leaflet of phospholipids or the cytoplasm in the case of this inner leaflet. And in the middle of the phospholipid bilayer, in the core of the phospholipid bilayer, you have these hydrophobic tails which interact with each other favorably, um, but they don't interact with polar molecules very favorably. So if this inositol 1,4,5-trisphosphate wanted to cross the phospholipid bilayer, it would have to get through all these hydrophobic tails, and it's not going to interact with those very energetically favorably. So basically, the way in which you um, manage to get these um, 
uh, in IP3 into a cell is you esterify the phosphate groups, basically. So you add long chain uh, hydrocarbon tails onto these phosphate groups by esterifying long chain alcohols onto the phosphate groups. And uh, that those long chain tails that you can esterify on, basically, which I'll draw like this, uh, so I've just put that we've esterified the phosphate group here. Those will interact basically in a favourable way uh, with these um, hydrophobic tails of the phospholipid bivalve. So these are esterified phosphate groups. Right. Okay. So that's just a technicality of how we get it through the cell membrane. When you get when the uh, when the IP3 gets into the cell, what happens is that the uh, phosphate of uh, these these um, phosphate ester ester links are um, broken, basically, so you return it back down to IP3. Now, at the moment, we haven't discussed what caged IP3 is, because the, that's just a mechanism for getting it into the cytoplasm. But caged IP3 means that you put a group on this um, hydroxyl group on this second carbon here. So this is the first carbon in the ring, this is the second, this is the third, fourth. Uh, oh, sorry, no. Uh, 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 no, yes. It should be one, two, three, five. And that's just, um, so actually maybe it's the sixth carbon rather than the second carbon. Uh, sorry about that. Um, yes, for some reason, long ago, people decided to call this molecule inositol 145 trisphosphate rather than inositol 134 trisphosphate. Inositol 134 trisphosphate would be a perfectly legitimate reason, uh, sorry, a perfectly legitimate name for this molecule, in which case you would call this carbon 1, this carbon 2, this carbon 3, this carbon 4, and then you'd have 134 uh, trisphosphate. Um, but for some reason, long ago, someone decided to call it that, and it has stuck. So, in fact, you're putting on a massive group onto the hydroxyl group coming off this sixth carbon. So basically what you do is you take off this proton and instead you add what's known as a uh, photolabile group. Okay, so this is what is meant by caged IP3, not the ester links from the phosphate groups. Um, those are just there to get you through the membrane. Uh, what you need is a great big group on this uh, hydroxyl group of this six carbon. And basically this is going to inactivate the molecule while you, whilst you've got this photolabile group attached to the sixth carbon's hydroxyl group, uh, this is not an active IP3 molecule, even once the ester groups have been removed. Uh, and basically, the way that you can remove this photolabile group is by shining UV light onto the IV3 molecule, and that will hydrolyze this bond, basically, and what will provide the energy needed to hydrolyze that bond. And then what you will have is you have, will have normal IP3, i.e. the photolabile group will cleave off and you'll have an inositol molecule with three phosphate groups bound off it. So inositol 1, uh, 4, 5 trisphosphate. So that's what is meant by caged IP3 and that's the process of uncaging the IP3, shining UV light on and knocking off this uh, photolabile group. Right, okay, so what you can do is you can take a cell and you can put a certain number of um, caged IP3 molecules into the cytoplasm. So a fixed number of caged IP3 molecules go into the cytoplasm. Then what you can do is you can uncage those IP3 molecules by shining UV light on. Now, basically you have a certain number, a fixed number of caged IP3 molecules which you can release in the cytoplasm of this cell. And basically IP3 will then lead to the release of calcium from the intracellular stores. So this will result in a fixed amount of calcium release from the intracellular stores, basically. So if you put in a fixed number of IP, a caged IP3 molecules, then when you release them, if you release absolutely every single one, the amount of calcium you get will be roughly, of course, um, we can't say that it will exactly be the same number, but it will be roughly the same. Okay, so you have a certain amount of calcium to deliver into the cytoplasm. Now, you could either shine a huge great intensity of UV onto this cell all in one go and uncage all of the caged IP3 in one go, i.e. 
every single cage type 3 molecule would be hit by a UV uh, ray because you were shining on such intense UV radiation and that would mean that all of the cage type 3 was converted back to normal IP3 at once and that you got the entire release of calcium that this cage IP3 was capable of causing all at once. Okay, so there's how you get uh, one great big calcium uh, rise in the cytoplasm. Or you could release the cage IP3 more gradually, i.e. you could shine a bit of UV on, you could release a little bit of the cage IP3, then you could wait a while and do it again, okay? And um, basically what we can then look at is how effective, um, how much effect it has on the nuclear factor kappa B and on the nuclear factor of activated T cells. Okay, so uh, again, I'll just re-emphasize the point because it's worth re-going over. We are putting in a fixed amount of caged IP3. This means that if we uncage all this IP3, we can release a certain amount of calcium. Now, you can either uncage all that IP3 in one go and release the entire amount of calcium that that caged IP3 is capable of releasing all in one go, or you can do it more gradually. And we want to see, is there any difference in the way, uh, the temporal um, way in which you release this caged IP3, um, is there any difference in its effect at activating the uh, NFAT and the nuclear factor kappa B, basically? Okay, and it turns out there is. Basically, what you find is that there is an optimal way uh, to stimulate the nuclear factor of activated T cells and the nuclear factor kappa B. So we'll start off with the nuclear factor activated in T cells, so the NFAT, the NFAT. Okay, so basically the NFAT will, um, it will be stimulated if you release all the caged IP3 at once. Uh, you'll get a massive calcium spike, so let's draw the calcium concentration here. So this, if this is calcium concentration, on the y-axis, and this is time here, then you'll get an absolutely massive great calcium spike like that. Okay, and basically you do get activation of NFAT, but if we look at the total activation of NFAT, what will happen is it will go to some maximum value and then it will come down when the calcium comes down. So it's got some maximum value that where all the N fat is stimulated at once, basically, and it goes up to that. Now, basically, uh, the reality is that to get absolutely every single nuclear factor activated in T uh, of activated T cells um, activated at once, you do not need this amount of calcium. You've basically got more calcium than you need because. Uh, you have a certain number of nuclear factor of, act, of activated T cells in your cytoplasm. So I'll show this. You have a certain number of N fat molecules in your cytoplasm. Now, basically, once they are all active, you can increase the calcium concentration as much as you like, but it won't increase the overall effect that you have. So basically, there is some calcium concentration, and let's say maybe you only need calcium to go this high in order to get absolutely every single one of these NFAT molecules activated. So basically raising calcium this high is not necessary. It's not going to produce any more effect. So you've basically wasted all of that calcium because it hasn't had any more effect than it would have had if you just raised it to this concentration. Basically, there's some concentration which will recruit absolutely every single NFAT molecule. And if you go above that, you're not going to see any increased effect, basically. So that is why this is not the optimal way to um, stimulate NFAT. And we'll continue this discussion in the next video.